So we're going to start the second part of this morning session, and uh, uh, our first speaker is uh, Stéphane Mala from Canal uh, Médicaux uh, Paris, and uh, he will talk about uh, what is the rage today, deep learning, so deep neural network, and uh, learning by scattering is the title of his talk. Thanks very much, thanks for the invitation. So, uh, so I'm going to do the contrary a bit of what has been uh, done until now. Uh, first of all, uh, like, uh, I've just discovered that the battle was won by the French. It's in the Arc de Triomphe, apparently. It's not the use of one battle. Well, that's a good thing. I've had a question session, but it's an important question. And uh, the second part is I'm going to motivate my talk by uh, what has been done by engineers until now. Uh, as you were saying, Philippe, there is right now a huge amount of papers and realization about deep learning. So, what is deep learning? Uh, it's a very strange neural networks where you take an input, a signal, it may be an image, a sound, or whatever, and then you apply a linear operator, then some kind of fully nonlinear function which aggregates the variable, and then you repeat. Then a linear operator, this nonlinear pooling which aggregates, then a linear operator, and so on. And they do that on many, many layers, now until 10 layers or something like that. So at the end, you get a representation very nonlinear of your input vector. And then you do a simple linear discriminant classifier, or SVM, or whatever. And what's happening is that, so there are a number of names associated to that, Hinton, Le Cain, so on. They are now getting state of the art results in very large scale problems classification of images with thousands of uh, classes, speech recognition, which hadn't been moving for the last 30 years with Gaussian mixture models. Now they are improving that. Big companies, <coughs> Google, Microsoft, are using these things. And the results are really impressive. So what are they doing? Uh, they are learning the parameters of their network with an unsupervised approach. And then now there are more than a billion parameters within these networks. And how are they learning it? Basically, they encode. So the issue, the parameters are within these linear operators. They encode the previous layer by some kind of sparse coding technique. So for the first layers, if you look at the kind of operators they get, they get something like wavelets. And I'll come back a little bit to that. So now there is these greedy strategies to learn uh, these uh, networks. And as I was saying, they are implementing that on very large scale. So Google has a one billion variable network doing recognition. So they put millions of images within these uh, network that they get from YouTube and so on. And at the end, they get some kind of detectors which are very invariant, very specialized, like faces, bodies, which are automatically learned. So basically, the intuition is that they built YARC invariant representation progressively more and more and more environment representation with, through this yard. So, of course, the question is why? I mean, how come these things work? Does it really work? It seems that it's really working, but why does it work from a mathematical <coughs> point of view? And the claim that I'm going to try to do is that underlying all these things, there is a very different approach to high dimensional probability distribution. And that's what I would like to try to, to show uh, in this talk. So the initial intuition of uh, this engineer is basically that you are building in part. So I'm going to follow this thread and first of all work on from a deterministic point of view. So environments of our group. I'm going to try to show why when you want to build an environment of our group, which is a very classical math topic, but you want to in include some stability, in particular stability to the feomorphism you are very naturally led to that kind of structure. So that will be the beginning, and I will begin with translations to make things simple. And I will see how naturally we are led to that kind of structure. Then I will jump from that to models of stochastic processes. In the case of translation, it will naturally lead to stationary processes. And we'll see that we are getting uh, models of stationary processes which are quite unstandard. And in the last part of second and last part of the talk, I will look at the issue of unsupervised learning. What kind of learning are we doing through these uh, kind of network? And I will show that the ideas are quite different from standard approach. There are no Gaussian mixture, no graphical or Markov models, no copula. 
basically you are learning by learning contraction. You are learning how you should contract the space in order, in order to preserve the data. And that's what the, the main idea that is going to come out of all this. Okay, so let me begin with the issue of environment. So the, the first major environment you want to build when you're doing image or audio uh, classification is environments to translation. Now, environments to translation is something, of course, very easy to do. There are millions of ways to build the environment of the, the translation group. However, you want something more. If you look at the problem of, for example, digit recognition, so the digit may move around, but you also want to be stable to deformations. All these digits are deformed, and you want a representation such that if there is a small deformation, the representation should be similar, so you want some kind of continuity relatively to deformations. So the group you are going to deal with is not just a simple two-dimensional translation group, group but you're going to see appearing the infinite dimensional diffeomorphism group that you want to control behind it. Now the stochastic equivalent of that is of course if you have a random process which is environment to translation you have a stationary process that's the application to texture recognition for example but again the difficulty when you get these kind of processes is that when you look at them they are deformed because of perspectivity effect so you also want to be stable to deformation in order to realize that these two although there is a deformation in between, are a realization from similar processes. Okay, so I'm going to begin with that and try to see what kind of problems arise when you want to be stable to different models. <coughs> so first of all, environments to translation. So you have a signal x and function x that you translate xc, and if you want a representation which is environment to translation, of course the representation shouldn't depend upon the variables. So, as I said, there are many ways to do that, so this is a simple example with several peaks. The simplest way are canonical environments which just perform a registration. For example, you center the center of gravity, center of mass of your function, and you are going to get an environment. So that's very easy. The second obvious way to do it is to use the Fourier transform. If you take the Fourier transform of X, if it's translated, you just have a change of phase. If you kill the phase with the modulus, you are going to get something which is invariant. So the modulus of the Fourier transform is an invariant representation to translation. Now, the problem occurs when you begin to have a deformation. So you have a diffeomorphism acting over X. So instead of having a simple translation, the translation now depends upon T. So that's, for example, a deformation of this original uh, signal. Now, if you apply, okay, now what do you want? What you want is that if the deformorphism is small, if the deformation is small, then the representation should be similar. So what's the metric of a diffeomorphism? The classical metric consists in taking the sup of the gradient of tau, and that's the, 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 the size of the diffeomorphism. And if you want to have something which is Lipschitz continuous, you want that the distance is of the order of the size of the, the, the diffeomorphism. morphism. Okay? Now, that simple property is obviously not obtained if you do a simple registration, because you see your peak will have moved. Now, if you do a, a, the distance between these two elements, the distance is going to be very big because of the movements of the peak. Okay? So, you obviously have no such stability. The problem is that you have no such stability either when you use a Fourier transform. Because whenever you have high frequencies and you have a deformation, the high frequencies are going to move very much and the distance is going to be very big. And that's one of the major problems of the use of Fourier transform. In fact, when you look at solution of PD, is the stability to uh, diffeomorphism. So the question will be, how can you build a, a representation which is invariant and stable to diffeomorphism? Why? Because for classification, it's fundamental. All the signal images, sounds are different. Now, as I mentioned, people are extracting filters which looks like wavelengths. I'm going to explain now why wavelengths make a lot of sense whenever you have to deal with problems web which uh, has deformation within. And the key idea is that if you take a function which is regular and locally supported, if you deform, it looks like itself. So it's going to be continuous to deformation. So let me briefly introduce the wavelength transform. The idea here is I'm going to have a function psi, which is a complex function, real and imaginary part, which is like that. And I'm going to dilate my function 
by factor 2 to the j. So if you look in the Fourier domain, the Fourier transform of psi is what is called a bandpass filter, is 0 at 0 frequency and decays. And when you dilate it, it's going to be dilated in frequency domain as well. So you're going to cover the frequency domain with this uh, filter. And the way they transform, there is no orthogonality property here. It's a very old tool, also called littlewood pellet in harmonic analysis. Just consists in doing the convolution of x with each of these wavelengths. So an inner product with the wavelet translated. So you have the family of all wavelet coefficients. You also need to keep the low frequencies, so you are also going to average x. And if you do that well, you are going to get a unitary operator. So that's a very basic, it's also called filter banks and signal processing. You can also do that in two dimensions. In two dimensions, when you have an image, your wavelet, which is at the top here, you need to rotate it. So this is the real part, imaginary part of the wavelet. And then when you rotate it, it has different direction. When you, di you compress it, you have different wavelets like that. So you have a whole family of wavelets which have different orientations and different scale. With these wavelets, you filter your signal, so you extract information at different scale, different orientation. And same thing, you're going to keep the very low frequency. And if you do that well, you have a unitary operator. So basically, the idea is always the same. Make a convolution with a very localized function in space or in time. OK. Now, what's happening if I go back in one? If you have your signal, you make a convolution with your wavelet, you're going to get something which is very oscillatory. Certainly not in bar and by translation. It's a convolution. If x translates, the convolution product is going to translate. Let's do the same thing then with the Fourier transform. Let's take the modulus. And that's what I will call here in their context the pooling because you take two functions, boom, you aggregate them into a single function. Okay? One observation, the modulus is basically going to give you the angle. So it's going to push the energy of your functions towards the lower frequency. Okay? That's the envelope that you get. Now, out of that, this is still not environed by translation. If x is translated, it's going to translate. To make it environed to translation, you can average it. Okay? If you average it like that, then you get something which is environed to translation, at least locally. As long as the translation is small compared to the size of the uh, averaging phi, you get something which is locally environed to translation. Now, if you want something completely environed to translation, then you let phi go to 1. And then what you get is basically the L1 norm of these wavelet coefficients. OK, now you have something which is environed to translation and likely to be stable, but you've basically lost all the information. You just now have a bunch of L1 norm. It's a very weak description of F. So the question now is how to get to the remaining information. Now, what's happening is that you've been averaging to get your environment. So where is the lost information? The lost information is within the high frequency of this curve that you've removed. And this high frequency, you can extract it by computing the wavelet transform of this function. So it will be the high frequency carried by the wavelets. Now, these new coefficients, which gives you the complement of information, you want to make them invariant. How are you going to make them invariant? Same strategy. You kill the phase, and you average them. And now you have much more invariant coefficient, because you have that for any lambda 1, any lambda 2, you have a family of invariants. And now you begin to see where the deep structure is going to come in. You begin from your x, you apply the wavelet transform and the modulus. So you get the average and the layer of wavelet coefficients. Now for each of these wavelet functions, you retransform it. So you reapply a wavelet transform, you get the average and the new layer of wavelet coefficients. You want to make them invariant, so you are going to reapply a wavelet transform, you get the invariant output and the next layer, and so on. And here you just have a deep convolution network. Okay? So, this is the representation. The representation is the output of your network at each layer, which will give you invariant coefficients. The average of x filtered by one wavelet, two, three, and so on, with these non-linearities in between. Now the question is, what are the properties of that kind of representation? Now observe. How did you build it? You build it by cascading a unitary operator on which you took the modulus. The modulus is contractive. This is unitary, so this is a non-linear contractive operator. So you are basically 
cascading contractive operator. Cascading contractive operator will give you a contractive operator. The second thing is that W1 keeps the norm, the modulus keeps the norm. So this operator is going to keep the norm. So the energy of X is going to be spread in between all these and this. Each of them has its energy spread here and the next layer, then here and the next layer. So the overall energy of your signal will be at the output and at the last layer. But the last layer gets huge, absolutely huge, that's what we call that a scatter. However, as I mentioned, each time you take a modulus, you have a nonlinear transform which pushes you towards the low frequency. And one of the key elements is that when you do the analysis, you can prove that all the energy is going to get out here at each layer because these are the low frequency coefficients and the modulus pushes you towards low frequency. And therefore you get that kind of result. First of all, your representation is globally contracted. S of x minus S of y is more than x minus y. The second thing is all the energy of the network is going to get out. That means that the total energy of the scattering transform is the energy of x. And the third property, which is even more important, you get your stability to diffeomorphism. And that's remarkable because that's very non-standard of our environment. The representation of X minus the representation of acetone is of the order of the gradient. And to get that, you need to do something like wavelets because you need to do scale separation to be able to almost commute with the morphism. And that's one of the key reasons why, as long as translation deformations are the main source of variability, you get very good results when you do linear discrimination out of these things. Yes, this is true if I go all the way down, right? Yeah, to infinity. And what happens if I cut at some depth? Okay, if you cut at some depth, you're going to get some residual uh, energy. However, there is an exponential decay of the energy. So if you, typically we cut at depths two or three, very quickly. It depends the kind of signal you have, but you can cut pretty quickly. Let me now go towards stochastic models. Okay, let me put a stationary process here. Okay, and so this is going to be stationary because these are just convolutions, which are average. So you can consider that as being estimators of a different object, which I'll call here the expected scattering, which is basically the expected value of this quantity because you are making a time average, so that will give you an estimator of this quantity. So the expected scattering transform will be the expected value of these nonlinear transform of x. Okay? It's a representation of a stationary process. Now, with essentially the same kind of techniques, you prove the same kind of result. You are cascading a contractive operator. The representation is going to be contracted relatively to the mean square norm. So sx minus x y will be smaller than x minus y squared expected value exactly like the power spectrum in the same way that the variance is reproduced by integrating the power spectrum the variance of the process will be recovered by integrating or summing over all scattering coefficients but as opposed to the Fourier uh, case you are stable to deformation if you make a stationary random deformation of your random process x you are going to get a representation whose distance is of the order of the soup with probability one of the value that is obtained by the stationary by the stationary random deformation. Okay, I'm going to show examples before going. Well, I have to accelerate to unsupervised learning. So these are two images which have exactly the same power spectrum. Okay, you can't distinguish them from the first two moments. The first layer of wavelet coefficient, which essentially depend upon the second order, are essentially the same you see appearing at the second layer of the scattering coefficients which are very different because the second wavelet Psi2 captures the fact that this was much more sparse than this. I'm going to show you sound, so I'm going to try to make it. Two sounds have exactly the same power spectrum, clearly very different. First layer of coefficients are essentially the same because they essentially depend upon the second order moments. These second order coefficients are very different because they depend upon high order moments and they capture the fact that you see appearing these kind of stripes over there. I'm going to do some few synthesis of sounds. The first synthesis will be from Gaussian models, then from these scattering coefficients. 
Now the Gaussian model. You hear this shh having essentially the same frequency. And then from the scattering coefficient. Here we are doing synthesis from much fewer coefficients, log n squared. So somewhere they are appropriate to capture something interesting with this, this random process. Okay, we did, and I'm sorry, I'm going to show first something. Uh, we did classification of textures out of that. It's interesting because power spectrum is a very effective way to classify uh, stationary processes. But these kind of things, you get error of the order of 1% on the very standard database. There are plenty of databases of textures. Why? Because there are many textures that have exactly this, well, there are some textures that have exactly the same uh, power spectrum. So the Fourier spectrum gets an error of the order of 1%. On um, all the databases we've, we've tried, there is a very big improvement when you go to that kind of representation. Here we go to 0, 2%. Okay, I'm going to jump we did things on environments over other groups because I would like now to go to learn. Okay, how can now we can interpret all that from a broader perspective? What are we doing? We have an operator, which is a wavelet transform, which is taking us from Rn to C uh, uh, n plus 1, the bigger space, okay, which preserves the norm, which is unitary. And what are we doing? We are doing a very simple iteration. We take at each layer our random process at the layer M of the network, we center it, we take the transformation through this unitary operator, and then simply this modulus. Okay? And then we just iterate on this. So we begin from X, get the expected value, center it, apply W1, and take the modulus. Then take the expected value, apply W2 modulus, and so on. That's what are these things essentially doing. And what is the expected scattering? It's just the output of this network. Okay, so you have a kind of dynamical system. I'll come back to it. Because you have unitary and contractive operator, you can show that this representation, whatever W you choose, is going to be contracted. And you can prove, because of the property of the modulus is sufficiently contracted, that the energy of that is going to go to zero. And ultimately, you're going to get a conservation of energy. All the energy is going to get up. The other thing is that this is globally contracted. So you, could very, you get very good estimators. Where if you have P examples, okay, and you want to estimate these expected values just by averaging the output of a P realization, you get an error which is of the order of 1 over P, which increases with M linearly, <coughs> but if P is of the order of 1,000, you are not going anywhere to go to any, any close to 1,000. So you get something very stable because you don't go to any high order. You just do contraction operators. Okay, now what are we doing from a point of view of high dimensional distribution? Imagine you have your very large dimensional space and you have your distribution which lives in some sub part of your space. What we're doing is iterating over contractive operators. And what we're going to do is make sure that these operators don't contract too much the data the space of the data, but contracts all the rest of the space. So we are going to contract over these operators so that each time the domain occupied by the data remains as big as possible. Why? Because you do that at the unsupervised stage. So you don't want to collapse things together because these things may belong to different classes. So at the unsupervised stage, you don't want to contract whatever are interesting data, but all the remainder of the space you can contract it because there's nobody inside this part of the space. Now there is a very elementary property is that you can show that the amount of reduction of this volume, of the blue volume, which is in fact the reduction of variance, is exactly equal to the scattering coefficient. So what gets out of your network is basically measuring how much the space is being contracted. It's the amount of energy that is getting it. So what do you want to do? What you want to do is to make sure that the energy is as small as possible for your data so that the contraction of the space occupied by your data is as little as possible. Okay? 
So that's exactly, in fact, what these people, in some sense, are doing. They're calling that greedy layer-wise learning. They, let me say, the type of pooling they do, they do very bizarre, uh, very different things. But I think that's very much in the spirit of what they're doing. So you have this simple iteration, okay? And what you're going to do, you begin from x, let's say x and minus 1. You are going to compute the new operator by trying to minimize the energy which is output by the network. So given x0, you center it, you compute w1 so that this energy, the energy of this is as small as possible because that's measuring how much you are contracting the domain where your data lives. And then you compute w2 by trying to make sure that the energy of the expected value of w2 is small, w3, and so on. So you are getting a simple, not so simple, but you are getting an optimization problem under the constraints of unitarity, and that's where we're discussing with Alex on how to solve that. But they do solve this kind of thing with stochastic gradient uh, algorithm. What's happening is that if you try to minimize that, this is an expected value, you are essentially going to get an L1 norm and you get a sparse representation. So saying that you want to minimize the contraction of the data domain is equivalent to building in that framework a sparse representation, operators that build sparse representations. And for the first layers, wavelets do very well the job for audio and images. Basically, you don't need to learn. OK, now you can have a different view of that as a dynamical system. Basically, you have a dynamical system, which is mapping x0 from x1 from x2 from x3. And you have a dynamical system with an energy dissipation, okay, which is contracted. So you can look how this dynamical system is converging. And that's a very nice work that is being done by Johan Walsberger, which shows that in fact it does converge to a limit trajectory exponentially. So, but all the information is in, is in the y end. That's the energy which is going to be output here is going to come from the reduction of energy of these uh, y n. And at the end you have an attractor which is a one dimension. Basically your space is going to be contracted until being a one dimensional line which is going to turn around uh, in your space. There are all kinds of funny properties. I'm going to add up that. Let's do it on the one dimensional variable. This is a very elementary problem. Take a one dimensional random variable x. Just iterate on that. So yeah, there is no operator. The modulus is a simple absolute value. Okay? I thought that that was a, st or a standard problem. I looked around, and it's not. And the property of this dynamical system is very interesting. If you do that, very quickly, your expected values are going to converge to soft thresholding of the variable. But very quickly. Soft thresholding evaluated at the sum of these expected values, which in fact converge to infinity the support of the probability distribution tends to infinity. What does that mean? That means that high order coefficient will give you measurement of the tail of your distributions as soft thresholding measurements. And of course, if you do the second derivative of your soft thresholding function, you recover the probability density. I believe that with that kind of thing, you can get very good estimators of 1D probability distribution of sparse uh, 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 density, but the work uh, still uh, needs to be done. It's just to show that on a such an element, the proof of that is not so elementary. It's a very nice work of uh, yeah. what, what, In what sense do you call them sparse density? Sparse in the sense that uh, singularity is zero and a tail which uh, decreases more slower than e to the minus absolute value of x, so Laplacian distributions or something. Uh, so that's whatever. Typically, a Laplacian distribution would be sparse distribution. That's what you get with an L1 distribution. Okay, so I'm finishing. Uh, morality of the story. The first thing is that it looks like you can do unsupervised learning by contraction, by just thinking on how to contract the space, basically how to estimate the distribution where you live by progressively contracting the space and measuring whether you are compressing or not compressing the domain of your data. Uh, there is a lot to be done from a statistical and probability uh, point of view. For me, a major motivation is the fact that these guys are getting such numerical success. It's very amazing how these things scale. Now there are neural networks that they implement on GPU with 10 billion variables. 
and they are able to do something with it. So I think that there is some mathematics to be done. Pay attention. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, it seems that the results depend strongly on the choice of father and mother variables. Do you have some idea? On the uh, weightlets? Uh, yes. You have probably in the theorems about stability or invariance, you should have some conditions on this. Uh, no. The only thing that you need is yeah. uh, this: the fact that the sum of the Fourier transform square of the weightlets adds to 1. So it's a very weak condition. And it's uh, that are analytic weightlets. The Fourier transform is negative, is 0 at negative frequency. These are analytic functions. But no, you, what you need is very weak condition. It's really the modulus, and that's why it generalizes. It's really the fact that when you take the modulus, the modulus is a very, an apparently very bad nonlinear function. But when you do it on a coupled of variables, so the modulus of a complex function, you don't create singularities, and you push lower with lower frequencies. And it's mecha this mechanism, which gets your convergence and the energy conservation. So you don't need strong conditions on the wavelengths. So you can use hard wave? No, because it, you need some... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you need something complex, because the Fourier transform has to be zero at negative uh, frequencies. So it cannot be strictly so complex. Yes. So there's no way to get rid of the L1 terms in your uh, learning problem, right? But no, and in fact... They're intrinsic. Uh, it's intrinsic. Uh, it, it, in these things, it's completely intrinsic. It's intrinsic. And, you know, for quite a while, I have, have been wondering why is sparsity useful for classification and supervised classification. So, finding sparsity suddenly, I'm happy to find it on the web because that's like something I was wondering. But, uh, no, not this one. So, one strong way of testing if you found the correct sparse presentation for some objects be able to generate new objects at random. And, uh, and uh, do those, like, do these kind of representations allow you to do that? Because okay, so that's what we've been doing in a very elementary way when I was trying to reproduce these stuff. Okay. okay. Because we were just working on the first two layers, and so basically we were capturing with wavelengths stationary properties. Uh, yes, that's what so we were listening to the features, or were no, when we were when I, we were listening when I was doing the synthesis. We were listening to the maximum entropy distribution having these expected values. So I was synthesizing probability distribution that had exactly these expected coefficients, and and you can view a Gaussian process as being maximum entropy distribution having appropriate covariance coefficients. So I was doing the equivalent of the covariance, but with the scattering coefficient. And the fact that you restore something which is similar from perceptual point of view indicates you capture something. But you're right. When now these people do that with pen layers, and what you would like is try to see what can you resynthesize with these kind of distribution models. All right. Uh, maybe just the last question. So in deep learning, they have this uh, sparse autoencoding problem, where which is non-convex. Looks like you are getting around it with the scattering. No, this is exactly what you get. The, this, the, the, the problem I was mentioning here, uh, yes, is exactly the minimization of that under that condition right. is an L1 mixed L2 L1 minimization under uh, unitary conditions. But in the first part of the talk, you don't try to minimize about this transform. You just take the wave no. transform. Right? Okay, why? Because I know that the variability group is translation. You know, if you give me the group, uh, whether it's translation, rotation, scaling, I don't need to learn anything. I know exactly the transform. That's why I began with that. If you know the source of variability, there is nothing to learn. The day you don't know anymore the source of variability because you want to classify chairs, you don't know the variability of chairs or things like that, you need to learn. And that's where you begin to do, to, to do that kind of thing. All right, that's thanks, Stephanie.